You are entering an investing state of mind the system doesn't want you in. The truth. You want answers? Michael Covell has them on the Trend Following Radio Network. And now, reaching over 130 countries and territories, Michael Covell. Today on the podcast, I have a fun guest, a very successful guest. In fact, his trend following success goes back to early 1984 when he was selected to be a part of the Turtle Program under Richard Dennis. My guest today is Jerry Parker. He was originally featured in my book, The Complete Turtle Trader, and we've had a chance to talk over the years. In fact, I met Jerry for the first time, and I believe... December 1995, so long time ago. But anyways, uh, our conversation follows. I happen to be in Saigon. Jerry is on the East Coast, separated by 8,000 miles. A nice Skype connection allowed this podcast to come together. I hope you enjoy it. So, Jerry, you know, we're exchanging some notes, and uh, I'm looking at your description of your trading strategy, and it's pretty straightforward. It's trend following plus one other thing. Yes, trend following plus nothing. I think that sort of sums it up. I think it's a very good idea to have a concentrated strategy that you can kind of become an expert in and try not to be everything to everybody. And it's also great that... uh, it doesn't leave a lot of mystery to the clients or potential clients of what they're actually going to get. Now, as you say that, I think you and I are both well aware that there's there's perhaps been some tendencies in the trend following space over the last, let's say, five years, 10 years, that we're trend following. Uh, it seems like some traders want to combine, combine trend following with, with other types of strategies for all sorts of reasons. I'm, I'm sure you've, you've witnessed this as much as I have. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's understandable that you would want to build a business and grow a business and create a product and a service that is um, more tolerable that people can kind of enjoy and not take their money away. I mean, certainly the toughest part about being a money manager or a CTA is having to sort of meet the needs of clients when that may contradict what you think the right thing to do in the markets is. <clears throat> so adding counter trend or shorter term trading systems makes some sense. And then I think the sort of what I would consider to be sort of a plague on the industry or in, uh, on trend following in general is the amount of non-trend following trades that profess trend followers do under the guise of money management. And money management is more important than anything else, quote unquote, smoothing out the returns, having a high sharp ratio, Uh, Trend following is so weak and feeble that it needs this uh, oppressive money management overlay to get out of the trades and when before the trading stop gets hit, before the system actually says you should get out of the trade. And let's just do it all for this uh, money management reasons, the ultimate god of trading that can override any of our systems or any of our ideas if we feel the markets are too volatile and too correlated, we need to step in and, and help our, help out our system. Uh, when I used to do that back in the early days of trading, 1984, I was I would just call that a lack of discipline. I would get nervous and afraid. The markets were uh, volatile, and I was giving back too many profits, and I was just not able to sit through and follow my system. I would just call that discretion and overriding the system and a lack of discipline. Now you can just build it into your system, uh, some of these same bad ideas. You can just call it part of the system. So I sort of call it uh, systematized discretion. Uh, CTAs tend to have a tendency to do the big back test, looking at the past 25 or 30 years and coming up with a system of entries, exits, and stop losses, and then proceed to sort of override it on a daily basis with volatility targeting or taking profits or just trying to find any way to smooth out the portfolio. You know, it, it's, I want people to have a, a, a decent feel for this. So when you talk about your trading going back to 1984, if I'm not mistaken, we're talking 
with the, the, like the first month of 1984. So, you know, you're, you're giving some wisdom to the audience out there that you've seen all types of environments. You've seen all types of, quote, cycles. You've seen uh, assorted newscasts for the last 25 plus years and, and things always sound different and there's always a new, new thing. But you've kind of stuck to your guns and, and done your strategy for a long time. And uh, how has that affected you psychologically to see all of these different, you know, different times, different periods, and, and your strategy has continued to weather through and produce results? Well, it's very gratifying. I think that's the life of uh, sy systematic trend following is that we have the strength to go forward each day because we've looked at 20 or 30 years worth of past data and created a sample size of thousands of trades that we can legitimately call um, the sample size of our system and we can feel good about carrying forward into the future. And the problem with that strategy is the same thing that's the benefit of it is that you you've got the two thousand you got the three or four thousand trades to look at that you're gonna that you can rely upon but then you can't make a lot of changes because if the markets are changing the C, the trend following CTA should be the last person to figure it out we're not going to be able to just rely upon the last couple of years worth of data so on one hand it's good to have experienced that uh, all of that but it's even more important to be able to do the back test and the research to find out the best systems to trade and then you just sort of have to suffer through it and uh, just keep telling yourself that we built this on 30 years worth of data. We can't tear it all down on the last couple. You know, I, e even though you have been in this world for a long time in the trend following space, I still think that there's uh, a certain size of the audience out there that still has a hard time wrapping their arms around trend following is, is I tour Asia and I've been talking to, uh, sovereign wealth funds and hedge funds and mutual funds all across Asia. It's amazing how many of these folks with all of the education, all of the experience, and they are just, it's, it's long only and value and, and trend following just doesn't make it across their desk. So with that little lead up, I want to read something really to you quick and get your feedback on this. This is from the Zappos CEO, the online shoe seller. And I, I caught this wisdom that he said about his business. And I think you'd relate to it. And he said, the guy who wins the most hands is not the guy who makes the most money in the long run. The guy who never loses a hand is not the guy who makes the most money in the long run. Go for positive expected value, not what's least risky. You will win or lose individual hands, but it's what happens in the long term that matters. Hope is not a good plan and stick to your principles. I agree. And I would just uh, qualify one of, one of the things you said. I do think it's, I do think trend following is the least risky. Now, one can have the freedom to choose different amounts of leverage, and it can look a lot. You can have the the Prius leverage or the Ferrari leverage, but underneath it all, trend following is all about taking small losses, um, submitting yourself to the trend of the market, and if you and put, put yourself in gear with the trend, in the direction of the trend, and um, diversifying like crazy as much as you can, currencies, commodities, stocks, and bonds, and doing longs and shorts, and holding on for dear life, and being more liberal with your winning trades, and being very cavalry with your losing trades. So uh, you can't get trend following. It's all about risk control. It's all about deploying your capital in the right times and in the right amounts. I think that it's so important. That's why I don't like to use the term managed futures, because it doesn't really tell anybody anything. Most of the time when I hear the term managed futures, it's, it's, it's used to sort of convince people that adding CTAs to your portfolio can increase your return and reduce your risk. Well, of course, because we're trading in markets that most people don't trade in. Of course, it's going to, we've got these wonderful markets. That's really, uh, the heroes of what we do are these great markets that have these massive trends that we can create this great diversified portfolio. So of course we're going to be different than traditional markets. But I think it's very important to start educating people about exactly what we do, which is diversified, systematic, long-term trend following, and break down those components so people can kind of fully understand what it's all about. We absolutely have a tendency to just assume people know more about what we do and how we do it 
than they really do. Well, I know you bring, you know, if, I think if anyone goes to your Twitter feed, they can see that you bring quite a bit of passion to this subject and a lot of other subjects in your life. And, and I think passion leads to storytelling. And I think ultimately the, the phrase manage futures was put together by folks who wanted to tell a story. I just don't think, and I think you're making the point right there is that it doesn't tell the story of the most successful quote managed futures participants, traders are trend following traders and, and managed futures doesn't describe uh, them. And frankly, there's a lot of other strategies that can get grouped under that umbrella that have nothing to do with trend following. And it's almost like they, they glom on to you and your peers. Well, I think that if you see the world through the trend, uh, managed futures lens, you're going to end up with what we have now. But if you see the world through trend following, you're going to end up with funds that trade stocks only, bonds only, commodities only, diversified, which is what we have now. And so we should be trying to spread trend following to all, all around the world, all these different markets that investors need trend following. They need managers who are going to follow a systematic plan, rule-based plan. They're going to take small losses, go with the trend, and follow a system that's been back-tested and proven uh, over the past 30 years. And that that's the, the core of what we do. I think I often go and speak to uh, classes and give lectures at, at UVA, and one of the I was going up there one day, and I was going to give this big presentation at the very end. I just got really kind of lazy and decided not to do it because I was just wanted to just to be more off the cuff. And so I just went to the back of the room. I turned on the computer and I put up a screenshot with the Yahoo Finance. I put up a you know the chart of the S and P 500, and this was probably 2009. And I said, "Hey, look at the S and P 500." In January 2008, the S and P hit a 200-day low. January 2008. So all of the carnage that happened in 2008 need not have occurred if you'd have just humbled yourself and said, okay, minimally, no matter how I'm choosing to trade, fundamentally, technically, whatever, I'm going to liquidate. I'm going to pull back. I'm maybe even go short. But there's nothing that's going to protect capital and help investors and better than trend following. So some people are like going to reject diversified and the cattle and the hogs and the cocoa. And so we need to take, we should have taken a long time ago, created a stock only fund um, and let the primary message be trend following and trend following the markets that you like, low leverage to no leverage. You know, your mind can just go crazy on all the certain products that should exist that don't exist today because we've been focused on managed futures. This is what we do. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to ram it down your throat. If you don't like it, we'll just keep telling you that you should like it. And versus Hey, you know, let's do stocks only, no leverage. We'll just trend follow and show you over time and prove to you over time that this is really um, a methodology that uh, preserves capital and helps you earn a fair return. We're going to war every day in these markets and it's dangerous and you need to trade with trailing stops and stop losses and be very diversified. So nothing is going to do better than this especially if you believe in the first commandment of all trend following, which is you cannot predict the future. So you're destined to win. So it's no surprise that over a long period of time, the performance is very comp competitive. You know, one thing we've talked about, some of the, you've, you've mentioned some of the advantages in trend following and you know, how, how you approach trading. One thing we've, we've not really touched on, it's something that I've seen in talking to funds around Asia is the idea of when you produce your returns, your performance, it's often at a much different point in time than the uh, the long only value based guys. How do you get that point across to people when you're introducing trend following? Well, I mean, if you're talking about the sort of typical CTA diversified program, it's like I said earlier, it's trading different markets. So it's vastly different markets, just not different stocks, but currencies and commodities and interest rates. So it's going to be, more than likely, it's going to be different. Now, even on a stock-only trend following, you know, it's going to look different. The stock 
the trend following uh, continue will always underperform you know you know during a long term trend so like right now the the trend following stock programs they'll have a tendency to not do as well because they wait for the trend to reverse and so and then they'll get out when there's choppiness or when there's looks like we're in a downtrend so of course if you if you have the ultimate and r the riskiest investment ever which is buy and hold and you're willing to just hold forever then at some when that turns out to be a good idea like now it's going to do a lot better but that's when trend following sort of steps in like 2008 you know preserves your capital and understands when the when it's sort of risky to to, to still be long well that's that's something that i've seen over here that when sometimes you can watch these managers and and you start introducing the concept of trend following and they eventually are like well we can't do that we have limitations or we we're we're legislated away from doing that we can't go that way and but then ultimately to get them thinking about the idea of like well what are you going to do when the next outlier hits how is your strategy going to perform when the next black swan appears? And that's when they you, you can watch them. You, you, you see their, their eyes open up like saucers when they start to realize that they really are trusting the current system, whatever central bank is, whatever they're doing. And that's their whole strategy. And when they, when they start to realize, oh, wow, there might be something that can help me when the next big, unexpected, unpredictable event happens, they get very interested. Yeah, that, that, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I mean, once again, it's probably a, a, they might be able to do it if it was stocks only or low volatility, you know, no no leverage stocks. Um, and um, I've often thought that we, we would go in some of these meetings with uh, institutions, <clears throat> and we were, had a much better chance of getting money from the individual sitting around the table than we did from the actual institution we were visiting. So it does seem to be uh, a strategy that in a, an individual high net worth person or intelligent person can kind of grasp onto and say, oh, I may be able to do that with my own personal money, but there may be a few too many politics here for the company for me to, and job risk or whatever. I definitely think that some of the CTAs who deleveraged and uh, made their target return around 10 or 12%, you know, obviously during a bad period or a period where it seems that large institutions are more interested in preserving capital than traditional, um, you know, 20% return that CTAs would sort of go for. That was probably a good call. I do think that in the future, though, when the trends get, get better and when the markets are really good, that there will be a, a rush towards increasing leverage back to the old days and sort of what tr CTAs and hedge funds were sort of designed to do. Every now and then you'll read in the paper where people are sort of disappointed that Hedge funds are just way too conservative. Yeah. Let me ask you, Jerry. So, you know, like I said, people will be able to see your Twitter feed and you're not a shy guy when it comes to expressing strong views. And so, but explain to the audience, because sometimes I get a little bit of this in my writings and people will say, well, you know, Mike, wh wh who cares if you have this, uh, uh, this view of the Fed and who cares if uh, the government is involved in too much and uh, you know, because at the end of the day, it's just about following the system. And that's really true. But I don't think there's necessarily something wrong with having a uh, having a uh, uh, even a moral view on, on the right way to do things. But at, at the end of the day, those your strong views uh, don't that's not part of your trading. True. It's kind of nice because you can have the computerized trend following system that you know that with a complete 100 percent discipline it's sort of like an assembly line we create the systems the we run the our trade sheet each day it goes to our traders they, they do all the trades i can't intervene you know unless there's some major loss or something some major thing would happen but almost every day we're just doing the trades we're supposed to do and so it's absolutely fantastic and then on the other hand i can go to cocktail parties and talk to my friends and have all these crazy views and maybe they're right and maybe they're not um but it's really separating the um emotion and the kind of whole point of having strong views it's not what trend following is about trend following is about making hundreds and hundreds of small bets 
in many in hundreds of markets. A hundred we trade a hundred single stocks and we trade a hundred other markets, currencies, commodities, and interest rates. And so it's all about creating this portfolio where and creating and choosing the right amount of leverage to where all the trades are sort of insignificant. There's no there's no big huge macro theme or I'm not staking my reputation on one you know, it's on one big concept. It's going to it's like going to Vegas and playing a thousand hands of blackjack. None of them are very going to wipe you out, but at the end of the day, you know, you should make money in, in a responsible way. I remember back in the 90s, I was speaking at a conference, and there were broker broker conference, and people asked me my opinion of Bill Clinton and the economy, and I said, oh, I think the economy is going to be poor because Bill Clinton raised taxes, and we kind of know what happens when you raise taxes, and Reagan cut taxes, so there's your blueprint for the future. And then someone raised their hand and said, so you're short the S&P. I'm like, God, no. s and is an uptrend. I'm long. <laughs> so it's a tremendous amount of freedom to do, um, you know, to have your systematic, disciplined approach. Maybe it's not for everyone, but it certainly is for me. And then to be able to, what I feel like <clears throat> is my systematic, disciplined approach in politics, et cetera. But... There's serious money on the line when it comes to trading, and we need to take it as serious as possible and do all we can to ensure that we're going to put ourselves in a high likelihood of making money. And that other stuff, politics and all the stuff on Twitter, is just talk. You know, it, it's interesting. If I if I think about your career starting in 1984, and I think about the, the advent of news media and, and the information flow that has grown since 1984 – uh, it's just exponential growth, and there are there is a huge number of people on this planet that think more and more information will help them to make better and better decisions. And you've kind of known for most of your adult life that less information, in fact, one variable, perhaps the price of the instrument you're trading, actually is the is the best piece of information you could be using to make a decision, and all the other stuff becomes extraneous. And even though that's probably built into every fiber of your being, that that thought process is is foreign. I would I would maintain is foreign to the vast majority of people. Oh, especially in this day and age, <clears throat> big data, um, Google, everything in the world is much more complex, and everything around us that we see that's making our lives better on a daily basis. The technology we're using right now, we know, and uh, very smart people. Lots of complexity, lots of computer programs that are doing more and more all the time. And so, we've, in some respects, it wouldn't be um, illogical for us to think that, well, that's the path for investing also. But like I said, I think to some degree, investing is much different in the sense that it's trying to profit off of things that are not, have not happened yet. And so, from all indications that I've seen, it's probably better to limit the variables that you're going to be watching, especially if you're looking for it in a sort of a risk-controlled way. And if you're really concerned about protecting your profits, I mean, protecting your uh, capital and taking small losses, then, you know, this is, for, this is for you. I mean, I think trend followers can be kind of accused of being very passionate and religious almost as it relates to trend following and their love for the trend following. But certainly, we're not even close to the irrational buy and hold that because it's always worked or it's working now that it's going to continue to work. It doesn't really matter to me if it's worked or not and not built to, to take unlimited risk and unlimited losses. Let me ask you, Jerry. So when, when you look, I mean, we, we've talked about trend following in the sense that there's, there are up and down periods. This is not about trying to have a smooth line, perfect equity curve that only goes up. In my mind, that's that's kind of fantasy island. The only smooth, perfect equity curves that go straight up are either Bernie Madoff or long-term capital management. Pick your poison. It's either a scam or it's a bad strategy soon to blow up. But how do you – how have you learned over the years to – from a from a psychological standpoint and mental standpoint to deal with drawdown? Well, I just go back to – I mean, I think, you know, I work for Richard Dennis, and 
Richard Dennis sort of made this famous quote that I could print in the newspaper, my rules, and I don't think people would follow them. And I think that, I'm not sure exactly what he meant by it, but it just reminds me of, from, for me, how important it was to sort of be there and have a mentor and sort of live through those, the training class. And so, and have the, and, and live through drawdowns and sort of see other more experienced people's reactions to them. And from day one, you know, we were just always taught that um, the, the system, you know, love your system. And the system is what it's all about. It doesn't mean you can't change. It doesn't mean you can't, like for us, we've become longer term since 1984. I think that's our biggest, mainly only ch- most profound change is that we should be longer term. And it's pretty obvious. But whatever the system is, you should love it. Whatever characteristics it has, you should love it. Uh, one of the questions on the turtle application, you know, we had a hundred that part of the process was taking a true-false test, 100 true-false questions, and one of them was a trader should love their losses. And the answer is true because, you know, it's part of the system. So whatever the system does, you love it. it is it enough to do the back test and to to look to see how profitable it's been over the past and, and then to experience it year after year where it's almost always profitable? Is that enough? I think it should be. So all of the characteristics that produce this success – we want to complain about that. I don't think that's right. And I think that's the whole problem is that so many people want to start with trend following and then to prove their success over time and their how smart they are, they want to get rid of all the bad parts and just keep the good parts. And I think that's naive. And so sitting down through drawdowns is the right thing to do. The drawdowns create our edge. If we didn't have the drawdowns and in my opinion, some of the the larger the drawdown you can stomach, the more money you're going to make. And so I think it's part of the system. We're, the only thing we should ever be concerned about on a daily basis is doing the trades that the system dictates we do. And we should enjoy and appreciate um, whatever characteristics, the 40% winning trades, the trades that <clears throat> turn in the big profits to turn into small profits or turn into losses. All of these characteristics are part of what we do and part of what makes it work. And like I've told you before, the I don't really look at the drawdown as risk. Uh, the risk is how much I'm going to lose on my stop loss. So if I'm going to risk a half percent of my capital or 1% of my capital, that's my risk. The whole point of trend following is to take those small losses and to keep try to get a re- relatively reasonably high winning percentage Take small losses. And then when the trend goes, big drawdowns on open trades are not risk. They're volatility. And in order to make money, you have to sit through the volatility. Jerry, do you ever find yourself when you – we see this – I think I think it's a fair description. I don't think this is a political description, but I think it's fair to say that the actions of the Federal Reserve in the last bunch of years have been unprecedented. Do you find yourself with your strategy, your type of trend-following strategy – do you find yourself, even though uh, the Fed can clearly uh, cause markets to be a little more volatile and perhaps not be optimal for trend following traders, but with your strategy, do you find yourself actually being just excited at some point in time when you watch the actions of governments? Because ultimately, uh, in- unless the governments have got it perfectly managed forever, uh, there's going to be these fantastic opportunities. And it's going to be the strategies, at least I would maintain, it's going to be the strategies like trend following that will be sitting there uh, at the next the next run, so to speak. Do you ever find yourself looking at the political and economic events and, and then thinking about the type of strategy you employ and kind of actually just smiling to yourself? Well, right now, I'm not happy with <laughs> the performance and the lack of trends, but I do think that there's a, you know, definitely uh, the possibility I certainly wouldn't want to be trading any other way, and I certainly want to, wouldn't want to have fewer markets in my quiver. So I think we are sort of set up for, we are building expectation, as Richard Dennis would say. So, But at some point in time, it does get a little, you know, we're, we're trying to run businesses here, and it's not a theoretical experiment. 
And so you are dealing with clients who are coming and going and don't have the same stomach or the confidence. And how could they? You know, these are systems that we created and they're going to be highly influenced by performance. So that, you know, when I, when I, if I don't do the trade, if I'm not disciplined, then that's an obvious problem. Well, if the client is not allowing me to do the trade, i.e. redeeming their money, then it's, you know, sort of for business reasons, that's just as bad, I suppose. But yeah, I do think, um, you know, the governments are the ultimate counter trend trader. When I used to get in, when I first started in the business, and still today, if someone starts talking to me about somebody that's a, tr- that's a really, looks like they're going to be a good trader, they've had really good performance, my first inclination is like, well, is this a trend follower? And they'll say, usually, no, it's not a trend follower. And I'm like, good, great, because I don't want, you know, I'm not looking for any more um, smart people in this space. We've got enough, so let's try not to encourage people to, to come here. So I don't, definitely don't want to encourage the governments to all, us, all of a sudden become trend following. So they're creating expectation. They're doing counter trend trades. They're going to lose. They don't, they, they're going to, you know, they don't have enough money to continue doing what they're doing. And we just have to sort of sit around and continue preserving capital and biding our time and waiting. And you know, historically, there has been some indication that um, the greater the the, the worst of performance in one year maybe yields better performance in other years. So we're kind of probably being paid back for 2008. It was so wonderful. It was so awesome. CTAs were on top. So no surprise, the last few years have been kind of below par, and probably the next few will be way above normal. It's just you can't predict. There's no reason to predict, but we've got no choice. What What part of trend following what part of what we do do we want to not do anymore? Is it the diversification piece? Of course not. We're going to just trade stocks, just trade interest rates? No. Are we going to get rid of our rules and just trade by the seat of the pants? No. Are we going to become shorter term and chase all the little zigs and zags in the markets? Well, that's not going to work. And then are we going to stop taking small losses and stop paying attention to price and going and getting in gear with the trend? What do you get out of Apple? Well, you get out of Apple when it hits your trailing stop. It's never a surprise. It's not um, It's not something to even wonder about. I just, I'm just always amazed and just appreciative of not ever being confused. I'm frequently wrong, but never confused about what I should do. And some of the markets sometimes, uh, Apple's a prime example of a lot of smart people were really kind of, without a trailing stop, what do you do? Has the story changed? And what does that even mean? You know, what? Who knows? You can't predict the future. You know, got in two, two or three years ago. We'll get out when the trend changes and take our money and look to deploy it somewhere else. Well, you could you could look at the price data of Apple without knowing anything about that their products and have traded that successfully. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's sort of um, I mean because people were surprised that Apple was doing so well. And no one could have predicted the success that they had in hindsight, of course. But this is where trend following just shines when the markets don't make a lot of sense or they seem illogical. I mean, you know, prime example would be the late 90s in the stock market. I went in to a very famous hedge fund manager's annual meeting and he was so confused. He got into the tech stocks late, didn't know just had to throw in the towel and buy them, didn't know when he was going to get out. They made no sense. They had no earnings. Um, this is what trend following is built for. And that when the world doesn't make sense, we're allowed to really profit. And I think people have a tendency to overestimate the amount of times the world kind of makes sense. Do, when you're you know, dealing with clients, friends, associates, family members, people over the years, and such a huge element of the markets, obviously, Greed and fear. This goes back to Jesse Livermore's time. These things have not changed. But when you're trying to walk someone off the ledge with when they're when they're they've got that that lizard brain has got them and they've got that fear and they want to they want to do the the wrong thing. Are there a little? I mean, you've got a background as I believe a CPA accountant. You're very you're very pragmatic. I think everybody can hear that in your voice. But that's a is that a learned that's a learned behavior. And so, how do you get people? off that fear ledge and, and to kind of to come over to your side and to get you to, under, to to understand more what Jerry Parker does for a living. Well, 
Um, <laughs> I, I, I try to give you the easy questions, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's easy. I mean, I, it's hard. It's hard. You know, it's hard to do. I mean, and so, you know, on one hand, like I said, I, you, I sit down with people, uh, I'll have meetings with individuals and I'll sort of break it down. You know, this is what we do. It's diversified. It's rule based. And I'll print out charts. It's nothing, nothing is as good as sort of printing out a chart with some moving averages on it. The golden cross, when the 50 crosses the 200, you go long. When the 50 goes below the 200, you go short. And uh, it works, you know, and it's in the public domain. Um, and I think people do understand it. But I think at least 50% of what we offer people is the certainty that we're actually going to do those trades. Because when the going gets tough and you have multiple years of low to no profits and drawdowns <clears throat> and lack of trends, you know, the typical person is going to not want to do those trades and give up at the wrong time. And typical, I mean, I was that person when I first started trading. And like I said earlier, just having this sort of assembly line approach of downloading the prices, running the systems. Printing the, uh, sending the trades to the traders, the traders doing the trades. This is uh, a huge part of the service we offer, not just the trend following piece. I mean, it's a big, huge puzzle with lots of moving parts, with portfolio decisions to be made, markets to trade, and entries and exits. But the fact of the matter is, is that most of the systems that we trade, we trade lots and lots of systems with many entries and many exits. Fact of the matter is, they all make about the same amount of money, and I assume that there's lots of people out there who can duplicate those systems or get pretty darn close. When I look back over the years at all the stupid trades I did, and the, the knowing now that the systems we trade now are so much better, and then I think about how much money I made, it's just a testament to the power of the trend. You can be so stupid and so naive and so um, inexperienced, and yet, if you just go with the trend, you can't even stop yourself from making money. So, um, I lost my train of thought. No, but, no, no. I, you know, I yeah. one, one of the things I want to follow up on though was when you uh, you mentioned earlier in our conversation uh, buy and hold, and uh, just as a just not not a not a good place to be. And I think even now. With with the way the the S and P has has turned around, for regardless of the reasons people might say it's turned around, QE whatever, um, uh, it's still it's turned around. But people seemingly forget those those two fifty percent drawdowns that have taken place over the last decade. So why, why don't you, if you were just you know like you said with your friends, you're at a cocktail party and you're trying to get someone to wrap their arms around why buy and hold is not such a good way to be, how would you start that conversation? You know, first of all, I tell people a lot of times if when you get into a discussion with somebody and you you know that you're going to be at odds a little bit, the first thing you want to do is agree with them as soon as you possibly can. So I do think, I would sort of say yes. I do think buy and hold works really well sometimes. And like I said, if you have a long term trend from 2009 to 2013, nothing is going to be buy and hold zero because there as many times. In the S and P over those past few years, where we have been out because it looked like the trend had changed, or we were short because it looked like it was right to be short, only to see the markets rally and right now be higher than they've been over the past years. And so, but what that requires you to do is to never get out and to accept, almost in a religious way, the um, unlimited amount of risk. And who really wants to do that? In 2008 was a scary time. And what we need to do is to find the same, which is to trend following that they have for buy and hold stocks and try to show people that taking small losses and preserving capital and going with the trend and not being able to predict the markets and the timing of exits will be just fine uh, with a long-term trailing stop. And I think these are things that people can rationally understand and accept minimally put half their money in that and half their money in the S&P buy and hold. But there's where is the long-term trend following S&P fund? You know? So 
no, you, you have to go into managed futures with currencies and commodities and all this other stuff, which is just a tougher sell with some fair amount of leverage because, you know, we're still shooting for 20% returns. So I'm going to come out with a stock only fund on the Alpha Metrics platform in a couple of months. Uh, we've been trading this with our own money for a long time. And so it's going to be low leverage, no leverage, let's say, and then trend following stocks only to sort of give people you know, valid alternative. Yes, they should They should go into the diversified program. Yes, the diversified program will outperform it. We understand all that. But this is where people are. Let's meet them where they are, give them what they need, and they may not even know that they will need it or like it. But let's turn them into lovers of trend following and understanding that. And it just takes time, you know. You could talk to your blue in the face about some of these issues and no one will understand. And in the first good period of outperformance. Oh, I completely understand now. You've had great performance. I love this. <laughs> yeah. So everyone is going to be driven by performance to some degree. One of the things that I've seen in talking with fund managers across Asia is when you show them some of the um, the sample trend following performances, uh, you know, kind of the, the volatile performance, but always seemingly sloping upward for the long-term records like yourself. And they see that and they say, well, you know, that, that volatility kind of uh, scares me. And then you, you, you put up a chart of just the Nikkei and you say to them, well, is there anybody in this room? And, and generally, I've been talking to everybody that's been educated in the IVs in, in the States and they all come back to Asia to run these funds. I said, is there anybody in this room that can't imagine U.S. equity markets, perhaps at some point in time in the future, looking like the Nikkei? Is there any reason why that can't happen? And when they start to think about it that way, they say, oh, you, you can see, you, once again, the eyes laid up like saucers. And they start to say, well, maybe that, that volatile bucking Bronco ride with trend following is not so bad after all. That's pretty, that's pretty good, though, for us being 8,000 miles away, that we only had one yeah. cut <laughs> so, But no, I was making I was making. You got to tell me your secret, uh, your vacation secrets here. This is quite the epic vacation. <laughs> I don't know if it's a vacation anymore, Jerry. <laughs> I'm not, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm quite enjoying this, this side of the world. And I will have to say, since I'm in Ho Chi Minh City today, it is quite amazing to watch uh, – I guess I'm getting a little political here, but it's quite amazing to watch the communists uh, do capitalism a little bit better than America right now. Uh, so <laughs> they, they are we doing. Could, yeah, we would we could really make some uh, have some fun with the Michael Covell political <laughs> website, uh, some political podcast. <laughs> uh, you know, my tour guide here. She said that uh, she said, and this is interesting. You'll get a kick out of this. She said. She said. Uh, uh, she said, well, tomorrow you should go to the hospital. And I said, why should I go to the hospital? She goes, I want you to see how well the healthcare system works. I want you to see how long the lines are. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, um, but no, my point I was making there in the end, though, was just in talking to some of the fund managers is to say, could you ever imagine U.S. equity markets looking like the Nikkei? And the moment they think about, the moment they think about that, the, the volatile performance track records, uh, of trend following traders don't look that bad. Yeah, but I, I, I just think that uh, I agree with all that. I, I just think that a better approach would be, would have been in his, history, my, his, my experience would have been for me to say, hey, you know, we can continue to fight that battle or we can understand that right now um, a 10% drawdown in a CTA program is worth about 25 or 30 percent drawdown in a stock program so these are the facts so let's create a stock trend following program oh but we're managed futures oh yeah we're managed futures so i guess we can't do that well no we're trend following so let's do a let's as part of our um suite of products we offer it'll be a stock only no leverage maybe long only for for some people and to show the power of trend following and and help people get to a place with some experience loving trend following like we do where they say wow you know why does that diversified program always seem to do better you know over multiple periods why does it do better than the stock only well it's lots of different markets and they're much more different than a couple hundred stocks and you know there's coffee freezes and there's wars and hurricanes and whatever but you know, you make the good point too, and I haven't, I haven't uh, responded back. But you know, your focus is on the strategy, 
And, yes. and, and so many people want to focus on, let's say, the name of the market. You're trading commodity markets, or they want to tr- they want to focus on the instrument. You're trading futures, and that doesn't tell that doesn't tell the investor anything. But if you say, "Here's my strategy," then they can wrap their arms around that. And then if you can if you can learn how to apply the strategy, and you're you're bringing that out with stocks right now. But if you, if you if you can apply the strategy to all types of instruments or markets, as a, as opposed to this, this fixation, and like we started at the beginning of this conversation. With the, the negative connotation that managed futures brings to the table, exactly. We we should uh, look at all the different um, hedge fund strategies and mutual fund strategies, indexes, and have a trend following knockoff of every single one of them. Similar leverage, you know, some, but bring our expertise into money management, money management, portfolio management, turtle money management. I mean, this is a huge part. It's not just the buys and sells. It's ju- the judicious use of leverage at the right time, leveraging up some markets, leveraging some down, um, creating a real diverse portfolio. These are revolutionary strategies that we need to th- thrust into the traditional world. We don't need to uh, let them corrupt us with their incorrect thinking about how to 60-40 and s and and cap weighted and things like this. We have so much to offer, but we're trying to relegate ourselves to the alternatives so we can assure ourselves it will only ever be five or ten percent. Trend following needs to be close to a hundred percent. I mean, in these days and times, buy your diamonds, buy your gold, buy your silver, buy your real estate. Okay, absolutely. But and your cash, possibly. And then Create a diversified, invest in a diversified basket of trend following CTAs because what part of your portfolio is not worth having a stop loss or a trailing stop? Which part do you want to just sit there and have it subject to buy and hold and never getting out? If it, if it goes down 10%, no, we're not out. If it goes down 20%, no, we may buy more because we're, we believe in this, um, philosophy that, um, the markets always rebound, and maybe they always will. But I'll take the trailing stop. I'm, I'm an accountant. I'm too conservative. You know, you've mentioned leverage a couple times in this conversation, and I know my conversations often. Um, sometimes the individual investor or other uh, fund managers they hear the word leverage and they immediately have negative thoughts. And I just think of it as like, well, hold on, it's a tool, and if it's properly deployed with a loss management strategy. Why not use that good tool? I think sometimes people don't realize that traders like yourself, yes, you might be using leverage, but you're not a cowboy. You've got stops in place. You are protecting your downside. You're, quote, protecting the principal. You're, you're, you're not being cavalier with it. I, I think sometimes people don't understand that. Yeah, but still, you're giving the, a little bit of the impression that um, what's, we're, we may be using too much leverage for your taste, but we're gonna, we can bail ourselves out with the stop loss. I think it's even better than than that. I mean, I think, like I said earlier, you can choose the Prius uh, leverage, which is, let's say, that's targeting a 10% return, you know, kind of like the S&P, or you can leverage it up to targeting a 30% return, which is going to come with 30 and 40% drawdowns. But I think the... So once you get comfortable and you find a CTA that you're happy with that expected return, expected volatility, really the the... The genius of the way the CTA or the turtle money management is just creating a truly diversified portfolio. Because with with my stock sector positions, I've got to leverage those kind of down because they're really volatile. With my bond sector, I'm going to have to leverage those up a little bit to get them to equal the stocks. So I'm doing this risk parity. I think I read about risk parity recently. And I was thinking uh, this was something, something Bridgewater was telling to institutions, uh, this crazy new idea of risk parity. Well, I mean, I learned about risk parity in 1983. It's basically making all your positions the same size based upon the market's volatility. And so since you can do that by up-leveraging some, down-leveraging others, making the total portfolio now still around a 10% vol, well, this is the part of the traditional world that – Maybe it's a little far into the traditional world, but this is what another thing we can add. Just not the buys and the sells, but the diversified, the real diversified portfolio 
the real risk parity amongst all the asset classes with a systematic risk controlled approach. It's so cool when you think about it, really, just to be, if you think of yourself, if neither of us had ever been exposed to these subjects and you're a teenager and someone was just saying, yeah, here's the strategy. And, you know, you don't know what's going to happen at the beginning of the year, but we're kind of sitting in the cockpit and we're just, you know, if, if this market takes off and, and we're just going to get on board and we're going to ride it. And it, it's, it's such a, it's such a beautifully simple concept in many ways. And I guess I'm still astounded in many ways too, that it, that it's, uh, that it's not more widely known. And I guess, look, every, and I've seen this across, as I keep mentioning this, I've seen this across Asia. There is a vested interest in the long only buy and hold approaches to not change because all these people I've met are, are earning tremendous fees to deliver a subpar strategy. Yeah. And it's marketing. If we can just get everyone to agree that we shouldn't be held accountable. And that no one, you know, that buy and hold is the way to go or some sort of like closet buy and hold. Then we can raise all this money. We'll all convince them that this is, this is the way to do it. And stocks are the only thing you should invest in and you shouldn't trade them too much. Then we'll just get our little cut. So it's a total marketing strategy. Yeah. Um, whereas we come in and say, Hey, let's try to add value and preserve capital and diversify and actually get paid if we make money and deserve to be, to be paid. Well, this is. Not something that you know is, is going to be work for the for the majority of people. Yeah. Well, I think what's cool about trend following though too is that look, you you're a capitalist. I'm a capitalist. There's nothing wrong with being a capitalist. There's nothing wrong with having the desire to earn an income or make money. But I think I think there is, and this, some people might out there might think this is a little uh, corny sounding, but I think there's something noble about trend following. There's something authentic about it, and it's 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 seemingly honorable. Uh, now there might be people out there that are, that are laughing, but I, 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 that's my view. And I, I, I think it, and I've been affected by the, the many people that I've met in this space. And there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of honor. There's occasional, uh, you know, bad eggs here and there, but that's in every industry, but there is a lot of honor in it. I agree. I mean, it is sort of like a, a mission and a, and a calling and a sort of, um, philosophy of life and how are you going to deal with markets in the unknown. And so we do want to sort of spread that and, and get people to sort of like it. Although, like I said earlier, I am happy that not too many people <laughs> like it. And we don't need too many people buying into it. We do need to take money from counter-trend people over time. I'm not 100% sure if I understand or agree with most of your other CTAs that sort of can explain the sources of the returns I can't really get my arms around the hedger idea that that, but I'll just say anybody who's doing counter trend trades, I'm all for it. And I've actually been to dinners before where people sat across the table from me uh, after a really good run. Let's say a new CTA type person would say, "I'm on the other side of all your trades," and I'm like, "Okay, cool, good luck, good luck <laughs> with that." Yeah. But what I am amazed by um, is that my reaction to the markets and the daily trading and the performance is that I'm just amazed that I've, I'm so happy that so often it's proven that no one can beat the market. You can't predict these markets and you're just along for the ride. And so my philosophy, it's kind of like when a uh, an anti-tax Republican wins or there is evidence on my Twitter feed of, of articles where people are offering proof that low government, low taxes, creates more wealth. I like that. And so I kind of like every day, I love that my philosophy of trading is validated so often. And what is my philosophy? Is that almost doing nothing is going with the trend, taking small losses, trading long-term with trailing stops. It's just a little to the right of indexing. I've got a few more rules, but I mean, certainly my rules should be able to beat the, the alternative, which is to do absolutely nothing. And, but I just get a lot of gratification after uh, sitting there and, and sort of watching the markets cause havoc to people who think that they're really smarter than the market and they over long periods of time can beat the market. And I think, and that's another thing that weighs on you too is I'll read articles about managers that just have phenomenal performance. And I mean, it's just incredible performance. And then almost inevitably, five, 10 years later, oh, well, yeah, they're human too. And, all of the ways that they, all the shortcomings of a fundamental approach or a non-trend following approach sort of catches up with them. 
Well, you know, Jerry, I, I'm not going to keep you on the keep you on the horn here, um, but I want to know if there's if there anything that we've not uh, touched on today that you wanted to bring up, things you talk around the office or any other subject areas we've not talked about. I'd love to have you on again. I think people are going to enjoy this, but is there anything that you wanted to, to bring up or broach? Oh, I just uh, self-promotion. We have our Equinox Chesapeake Mutual Fund also out there. I do see that I do think that this is this whole mutual fund wave is a good idea, and my goal and hope is that um, you know Chesapeake uh, diversified, Chesapeake stock only. We'll continue to be able to find clients who will let us do our thing, and we'll continue to try to improve and make all these products uh, as cheap as possible and the best deal for people as, as it possibly can be. So we're trend followers. And the most important thing, the most other than being long term, longer term, the most profound thing that's happened to CTA since the '80s has been just to increase the number of markets. You know, the markets are the heroes. You could sit back and you make money on this short yen trade. I mean, I'm short yen. I'm long euro yen, Swiss yen, um, Canada yen, Aussie yen, sterling yen. Right. There is no idea that I could possibly ever come up with that's going to be better than being on those trends. Zero. And nothing in missing that trend. There's nothing, there's no great idea that I could possibly have that's going to overcome missing that trend. So these are the real heroes of what we do is all this great diversification. We're sort of like Google. You know, Google's one of their ideas was to uh, organize the world. We're just trying to just organize these markets into something that's manageable. And that's what sort of trend following allows you to do. It's, you know, sometimes the trades look silly. Sometimes you get out way too late and you're, and you buy 10 times in a row and they're all losing trades. But look, we definitely know how to take this, what seemingly looks like this incredibly complex world and organize it into sort of a manageable way that you won't lose all your money and you'll probably end up making some. But we've got to be all over the world. We've got to. Uh, when I was up at Alpha Metrics recently, I was telling them some of my ideas about products like stocks only, commodities only, bonds only, and they were like, "Well, we have no Asia on our platform. Let's do. You should do Asia only." I'm like, "Exactly. I don't even." I don't Jerry, 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 the, the energy over here. The energy over here is is so infectious. I, I, I in the last two weeks, I've said to myself, "When am I going back to the states? I don't know <laughs> when." It's so, it's so yeah. infectious. And, and the P, and when you're here on the ground, and I, I try to be a very, very low key on the ground. So there's no, I don't bring any arrogance, none of this, 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 this British or German expat stuff that I see in Singapore where they walk around like a bunch of drunks or something. So, but be, when you're on the ground and you will, you will sit down and, 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 and have those conversations with the Singaporeans or the Vietnamese and they know that you're kind of not giving them the old colonial look. I'm telling you that that's that's the that's the magic of this whole part of the world. They'll they'll work with Caucasians, they'll work with Westerners. They just don't want to feel that colonial thing. And uh, I think that's the secret. That's the secret that I'm learning on the ground. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, um, when I do when I read books, when I travel, when I read articles, I see the entire world through the lens of trend following. And uh, I would love yeah. to be there and experience that. I could just and and I just. Probably be a lot of fun to see the potential uh, for, you know, for the for these markets that are opening up. And it's like you were saying earlier, sort of ironic that we label them as communist and stuff or whatever. And they, I guess, arguably do have these governments that are in some ways much different than ours. But it, you know, ours does seem awfully anti-markets sometimes, and the Asians seem uh, more market-driven. <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting too. As when I first met this one tour guide over here, and we were talking, and uh, she uh, she just starts pulling out her money and just starts counting her money. I mean, she's she's twenty eight years old. She's making like a uh, couple hundred dollars a day, and uh, basically off American tourists coming over here. And it, it just you just see that excitement. So I had to do a few edits there on the end because Jerry and I started having a, a personal conversation a little bit outside the podcast and uh, had to make a couple edits to take those out. But uh, great conversation. I think Jerry uh, presents trend following in a fantastic light for those that want to learn about it or want to invest in it or want to use it. 
Uh, just very appreciative to have him on, and hopefully we'll have him on again soon. The common question that I receive, where do I start? Where do I start if I want to be a trend-following trader? My books. First place to start are my books. Trend Following, The Complete Turtle Trader, Trend Commandments, and The Little Book of Trading. Also, my trend following film broke the new American dream. Those five places are where you start as a trend following trader. That's it. Dig in. Now, if you want to support the cause and you want to learn faster and you want the ability to have a teacher who could answer your questions and give feedback and make the process even smoother quicker get you there faster i have training i have training and i have systems that can get you there quicker for that education for those systems you want to go to trendfollowing.com i'm a very simple man these days if you want to learn i can help you if you don't want to learn there's always cnbc there's always bloomberg there's always just delusion. Sometimes delusion is nice. Sometimes just you can just be deluded. You can just put the horse blinders on and pretend. Pretend that trend following doesn't exist. Just go back to buy and hold. That's one way around it. But if you have a pulse and you still really want to get rich, I can help. One last thing. If you'd like a free trend following DVD, one of the most interesting people that I've ever met, one of the most successful trend following traders that I've ever met, a man who pulled a hundred million dollar fortune from the markets, go to trendfollowing.com forward slash win, W I N, trendfollowing.com forward slash win.